Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana. SIPhysicians.org Main Source Bank, headquartered in Greensburg, Indiana, offering products and services to fit every stage of life. More information at mainsourcebank.com. Main Source, life needs a great bank. Member FDIC and equal housing lender. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company. Fiber Internet, HD, and digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. In May, residents in East Chicago learned their community had a severe lead problem. And still, not all residents have been able to move from their contaminated homes. I'm very optimistic in the fact that there's a lot of effort to help out. You know, East Chicago and the area help build parts of the state. Well, now it's time that we've come in and asked for a little bit of help. The governor wants to make it easier for communities to establish needle exchanges, but his plan for less state involvement is facing some challenges. They just think it's giving people needles and then you're condoning drug use. Coming up, how fewer restrictions might still not lead to big expansion of exchanges. About two dozen bison are roaming a prairie in the northern part of the state. Conservationists recently brought them in. Ahead, we explain the important role they're playing in land preservation. Those stories, plus a roundup of what happened this week at the State House and the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. New Governor Eric Holcomb promised in his State of the State Address to make it easier for counties to establish syringe exchange programs, and a bill moving through the legislature would make that possible. As Becca Costello reports, the programs aimed at reducing the spread of HIV and hepatitis C still face significant opposition. Hepatitis C cases in Tippecanoe County have been increasing about 30% each year for the past three years. Health officials have been working on a syringe exchange proposal for more than a year. County commissioners approved the plan last November and the state health department approved a month later. But the program won't be ready to open for at least another few months. There's a lot of different parts and trying to make sure all those parts were met to have the state approval for their syringe exchange program was a daunting task for, um, and some people were kind of scared of that process here. An unprecedented outbreak of HIV cases in Scott County two years ago marked a change in how state officials addressed the state's drug epidemic. People here were sharing dirty needles to shoot up powerful prescription painkillers. Then Governor Mike Pence approved a bill that allowed counties to establish programs where intravenous drug users could turn in used needles for clean ones. But counties have to get state approval before they start an exchange. We have heroes on the front line saving lives every day. They include the public health nurses who run syringe exchange programs in nine Indiana counties. And that's why we will give county officials authority to establish syringe exchange programs to ensure that the people making the decisions are those closest to the problem. House Bill 1438, authored by Republican Cindy Kirchhofer, eliminates the step that requires state approval. It has bipartisan support, but does face significant opposition from new Republican Attorney General Curtis Hill. Hill testified at the House committee hearing, saying syringe exchanges encourage drug use. But the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says that's not true, and they encourage the expansion of the programs nationwide. It, it seemed like he wasn't really aware of, of the research and evidence that's out there that that is not true. Um, in fact, it, it reduces the harms associated with injection drug use. But Attorney General Hill isn't alone in his concerns. Back in Tippecanoe County, progress is slow because of local opposition. A lot of people don't understand exactly what a syringe exchange program is. They just think it's giving people needles and then you're condoning drug use. 
But Hostetler says the programs offer a lot more than that. Overdose intervention drugs, health insurance help, referrals to addiction and mental health counselors, help with transportation, food, immunizations and vaccines. The programs will offer STD testing and condoms. And all of that is free for participants. Those costs add up quickly, and state law prohibits any state funding for the programs. Securing the funds from private donations and grants is the biggest reason there's not already a syringe exchange in Tippecanoe County. It's been almost all um, funding. We already had our plan in place. We already knew what we wanted. The state approved our plan immediately. Uh, we never had to go back and forth on that, so everything has been funding. But state funding isn't being addressed this legislative session. Before the election, Holcomb expressed tentative support for funding syringe exchanges through the state, but he now defers to a new statewide position he created, the executive director for drug prevention, treatment and enforcement, Jim McClelland. McClelland fully supports the proposal to give county officials authority to establish a needle exchange, but he hasn't announced his position on state funding. I have a laundry list of kind of like what I want this to look like, um, but I feel like this bill initially has moved in the right direction, and I think Governor Holcomb was very brave in, willing, in his willingness to even state this needs to be brought down to a local level. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Becca Costello. House Bill 1438 has passed out of the House and now moves on to the Senate for discussion. Now, as we've reported, there are several bills this session that pertain to the opioid epidemic. One has to do with naloxone. That's the powerful opioid antidote. Naloxone can reverse a person's overdose, but it can't stop their addiction. That's where treatment comes in. But getting into a program can be difficult. Barbara Brozier reports on a bill that would give those who've been convicted of a drug crime or revived with naloxone priority admission into drug court or treatment programs. Several police departments and parents testified in favor of the bill, saying the opioid epidemic can't be stopped without proper treatment. The city of Fort Wayne saw 81 overdose deaths in 2016, and crime is up there because people are desperate to feed their addictions. When we come across someone that's uh, overdosed, if there's still product on scene, we will charge them with that after they've received medical treatment. But filling up our jails is not the answer to fill uh, with addicts. A mother who buried her daughter this week after she died from an overdose says the bill is a necessary step to help combat such situations. We release them from the hospital with the untreated substance use disorder. And we, un we wonder why they continue to overdose. The committee will revisit the proposal next week. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Barbara Brozier. Now, before we leave the State House, let's run through some other bills that saw action this week. Plans to build a casino in Terre Haute are on hold indefinitely after lawmakers voted against the proposal. The legislation would have moved unused gambling slots from southeastern Indiana's Rising Sun Casino to Terre Haute. The measure failed 5 to 5 in committee. The House approved a road funding bill that opens the door to tolling Indiana interstates. The bill includes a 10 cent fuel tax increase, a new $15 registration fee for all vehicles, and a $150 annual fee for electric vehicles. Additionally, the state sales tax on gas would be earmarked entirely for roads. Though seven Republicans joined Democrats in voting no, the measure now heads to the Senate. Indiana House Republicans have put forward a two-year state spending plan that counts on a revenue from $1 per pack cigarette tax increase. The nearly $32 billion plan includes a modest funding increase for K-12 education and directs an additional $10 million to the state's preschool pilot program. It sets aside $5 million for efforts to be undertaken by the state's new drug czar and would give Indiana state troopers a 12% pay raise. Language in a bill about abortion regulations now requires doctors to tell patients their medication-induced abortions can be reversed and also tell them that no scientifically validated study confirms the practice. After the language was amended, the bill passed through committee. Well, it seems the legislature doesn't have much appetite this session for a conversation on redistricting reform. 
The House Elections Committee chairman denied his committee on a vote on comprehensive redistricting reform legislation this week and won't guarantee a vote on the bill this session. A bill that would set guidelines for determining who can be released from jail on bail passed out of a Senate committee this week. The bill says people who do not present a substantial risk of fleeing or danger should be released without bail. The reality is, if you're poor, you stay in jail. If you have money, you can bond out no matter how dangerous you are. The proposal comes after the Indiana Supreme Court adopted new rules last year asking courts to use evidence-based risk assessments to help make pretrial release decisions. A Senate committee has approved a bill that eliminates much of the financial incentive for installing solar panels. Solar panel owners who feed surplus energy to the power grid are currently compensated at a retail market rate. Originally, the bill would have allowed utilities to reimburse those people at the lower wholesale rate. An amended version allows people with existing panels to receive the full retail price for 30 years. People who purchase solar panels within the next five years will get the retail rate until 2032. While well, the so-called Airbnb bill is headed to the Senate, which bars local governments from banning short-term rentals. The bill would ban residents from renting out their homes for more than 180 days total in a year. This was the bill's second attempt at a passage in the House. And if a private or religious school in Indiana is rated a D or F for two consecutive years, it loses the ability to accept publicly funded vouchers that help students pay tuition. But some House Republican lawmakers want to give these schools another chance. Their proposal would create an appeal process for private schools. When private school vouchers were introduced in the state, supporters said they would let poor families escape failing schools. Now for headlines, we go over to Lindsay Wright, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. More than two dozen hate organizations operate in Indiana. That's according to a new report from the Southern Poverty Law Center. The Ku Klux Klan and white nationalists are most prominent, both with seven located across the state. Among the other groups are neo-Nazis, racist skinheads, and black separatists. 25 new hate groups formed across the country between 2015 and 2016. The most dramatic increase was in the number of anti-Muslim groups. The report lists one anti-Muslim group in Indiana. The state announced this week construction on the stretch of I-69 from Bloomington to Martinsville will continue through at least May of 2018. It's part of a memorandum of understanding reached with the private developer in charge of building and maintaining Section 5 of the interstate. Barbara Brozier has more. The orange construction barrels you see along the highway behind me will be here for quite some time as work on Section 5 of I-69 continues. Now, this project was supposed to be complete in October of last year. That date keeps getting pushed back because of ongoing delays. Now, as part of the memorandum of understanding reached this week, the state says all four lanes of traffic through Bloomington will be open by mid-August, and the project will be complete by May 31st of 2018. Bloomington Mayor John Hamilton met with Governor Eric Holcomb to discuss the developments and says he's cautiously optimistic about the completion of the project. Well, it was a very civil and frank meeting, and, you know, he's a new governor, and I, I want to give him a chance to do it right, given what he inherited. Um, and, uh, you know, he assured transparency. He assured me the Department of uh, Transportation Commissioner would work closely with us. Now, while the delays won't cost the state any additional money, the developer and main contractor on this project will pour an additional $75 million into construction. Reporting in Bloomington, I'm Barbara Brozier for Indiana News Desk. And that memorandum of understanding has to be approved by the developer's bondholders before it's legally binding. President, Indiana Senate budget architect says he's trying to find the money to move ahead with two of the state's bicentennial projects. Their future remains uncertain after the governor pulled out of a cell tower deal last week that was supposed to cover those costs. That means legislators have to look elsewhere for nearly $50 million for a new state archives building and an inn at Potato Creek State Park. I think maybe the archives building, just because we've had such a desperate need for that for so long, might have a little higher priority. But 
I'm hoping that we can deal with both issues, both projects. Legislators did find money to com complete some of the smaller bicentennial projects, including the Bicentennial Plaza near the State House. Well, tax season is here, and Indiana is one of few states that provides Olympians with a special income tax exemption. Legislators passed a bill in 2014 that means Olympic medals and bonuses from the U.S. Olympic Committee aren't subject to state income taxes. Congress passed a similar measure last year. So there's a sort of overlap this year where uh, Indiana Olympians could actually get the, it deducted twice, get, get kind of a double benefit this year because Indiana has it as well as on the federal level. Gold medal winners get a $25,000 bonus, and Joe, that could have equated to more than $5,000 in taxes. Oh, wow. but none for us. No, not Just for us. Just for the Olympians. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Thank right. you, Lindsay. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. It's been months since residents in East Chicago began learning the magnitude of a lead crisis in their community. The situation is far from resolved, but a disaster declaration from the governor is giving some people hope that long-awaited assistance may be coming soon. Plus, bison are being relocated to Indiana, ahead why conservationists think the animals could be the key to restoring some of the state's prairie lands. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. We are a nation of explorers. We seek new ways of living, of thinking, and of expressing ourselves. We take risks, we learn from experience, and we keep moving forward. That's why we encourage and celebrate the explorer in all of us. Ten thousand. Fifteen? Fifteen, do you think? Twenty. Twenty-one thousand? Six hundred. Twenty. Eighteen five. Twenty-four. It's at least forty. Look, yeah, look at 4, it. Forty-five hundred thousand. Six fifty. Twenty. Six fifty. This textile would be worth about a half a million dollars. Half a million? No way! I knew it. It's just a blanket. Laying on the back of a chair. Well, sir, you have a national treasure. Wow. A national treasure. Congratulations. I can't believe this. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Well, residents in the Calumet neighborhood of East Chicago have been living on land contaminated by lead from old factories for decades. The Environmental Protection Agency has been aware of the problem and actively testing swell there since the 1980s. But the severity of the crisis really came into focus last fall when EPA officials tested drinking water and found elevated lead levels in 18 homes. Since then, hundreds of families have been displaced. There's a chance now they might get more help from state officials to combat the crisis. But as Nick Jansen reports, some say it's too little, too late. A lot's been happening in the last few months since news spread about the extent of lead contamination in East Chicago. The West Calumet housing complex has been largely abandoned. The hundred or so families that remain can't find places to move. And students from Kerry Gosh Elementary School have been relocated. The state has provided $200,000 for testing and relocation costs, but given the scale of the problem, it's a drop in the bucket. Four pieces of legislation moving through the legislature would send additional aid to the area. I'm very optimistic in the fact that there's a lot of effort to help out. You know, East Chicago and the area help build parts of the state. Well, now it's time that we've come in and asking for a little bit of help. Harris's bill would increase soil and water testing for lead in the Calumet neighborhood. Some residents would like to see it amended to expand testing to the entire city. The other bills would provide aid to carry gosh and set aside money in case federal cleanup efforts don't sufficiently remediate the area. And last week, Governor Eric Holcomb issued a temporary disaster declaration. It spans the 322-acre Environmental Protection Agency Superfund site, including the Calumet neighborhood and its 3,000 residents. Former top-level EPA official Jim Barnes says while the declaration is a step in the right direction, it's important to note that in the same week it was passed, lawmakers voted to override a veto from former Governor Pence to give extra scrutiny to any environmental regulations more stringent than federal rules. So what that means is a signal from the, the, uh, our representatives in uh, Indianapolis that in no case do they want to be more protective of people's health 
than whatever is put in place by EPA, and that's in a climate now when there clearly is a, are a lot of forces that are looking to try to roll back what EPA is uh, uh, doing. And if, if EPA and the state aren't looking out for, for people's health, uh, God save us. The disaster declaration, which Pence denied before leaving office, says the state will seek EPA grant funding to replace lead pipes in parts of the Calumet neighborhood. The EPA will resume soil cleanup in the spring, and officials say an order from the Trump administration freezing grants and contracts won't affect those activities. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Nick Jansen. So Nick joins us now. and. Kind of timely for us, uh, and I don't know if it's timely for the residents of East Chicago, but Governor Eric Holcomb was just up there today, uh, right? Yeah, that's right, Joe. And residents, city officials, lawmakers have been practically begging any governor to come see the area. Mike Pence did not visit, but Governor Holcomb was there today. He met with some of the affected residents and uh, spoke with city officials about how they might implement the uh, emergency declaration he issued last week. So talk a little bit more about that emergency declaration. What's all that about, and that's just for 30 days, so then what happens after those 30 days? That's correct. The declaration does a lot of things. Most importantly, it helps the residents who are still living in the West Calumet housing complex find a new place to live by March 31st. And that date's really important because the city, prior to the declaration being issued, said that by the 31st, anyone who was still living there are going to be involuntarily relocated to another public housing complex across town. Residents I've spoken with are nervous about that because they say that complex isn't in a safe neighborhood. It's not exactly clear what will happen after the declaration ends, but the state has directed the city to give it a list of any additional resources it feels like it needs, and they need to do that by March 5th. So the state of emergency is really a separate thing from what state lawmakers are doing. Can you explain the difference between those two? Sure, yeah. The legislative packages going through are not directly related to the emergency declaration. And the bill that has the most traction is from Representative Earl Harris. And that bill actually just passed the House yesterday, so that'll go on to the Senate for consideration now. Some of the other bills uh, were heard in the Senate Appropriations Committee last month. Luke Kenley, the committee chair, told me those bills probably won't get a vote, but they're looking at taking the language in them and putting it in the Senate's version of the budget this year. So this is a story you've been covering for months. Really quickly, what's it like up there now? You know, there has been progress. More people are getting their blood tested for lead, although sometimes they're slow to get the results, and more soil has been remediated. But, you know, people are still anxious and they're frustrated at the pace of recovery. Uh, when I went up there for the first time last September, people said they're angry, and I'm still hearing that almost six months later. Thank you very much, Nick. Thanks, Joe. The city of Bloomington is dealing with a lead problem of its own. The city says soil testing at the former site of a water tank revealed levels of lead in the soil that exceed the Indiana Department of, of Environmental Management's standards. The city says the lead does not present any danger if left undisturbed but some claim to have seen people access the site. Actually, there was a spot just like past this concrete area that the kids were digging underneath of it. And this part right here where this fence is tore down, they go over that. The city says the lead contam contamination was likely caused by sandblasting the tank for repainting. The city is planning to test the soil at four other sites. The Indiana chapter of the Nature Conservancy is trying to restore a rarefied ecosystem in the northern part of the state. It's been going on for about two years. This phase of the restoration is dependent on an animal that used to roam the state, the bison. Uh, today we've got uh, over uh, 6,800 acres of prairie uh, restoration, prairie planting here on site. Uh, the latest phase of that restoration process has, uh, has been bringing in bison. If you look at the state seal, there's a bison running away. We brought bison back to the state. It's very exciting. And with those bison historically, with those large grazers in those, this, his, those historic prairies, there were uh, areas in the prairie that were short. It's no surprise, bison eat grasses. And uh, with that short grass evolved a whole community of, of plants and animals that, uh, that lived in short grass prairie. When bison were extirpated from the state of Indiana, those prairies were quickly converted into row crop agriculture. And so uh, bison are nice, it's just part of their daily lives is, is consuming grass. And so they're creating this, the short grass community 
uh, that we're looking to uh, promote here. This project is really about biodiversity. It's really about, uh, it's about the native plants and animals. And so by getting people here, we hope to educate them uh, to what our mission is and what our, what our, what our goals are, and so they can have an appreciation for, for this project. The visitor's area at Kankakee Sands is open from 7 a.m. to dusk every day of the year. They're expecting that herd to grow, and soon calves are on the horizon. Well, that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, primary care and specialty care providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana, siphysicians.org. Main Source Bank, headquartered in Greensburg, Indiana, offering products and services to fit every stage of life. More information at mainsourcebank.com. Main Source, life needs a great bank. Member FDIC and equal housing lender. Smithville Fiber. The Gigacity Company, fiber internet, HD, and digital IPTV in southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you.